Alrighty, let's go ahead and finish graphing this. So we had just completed our table. I showed you how to plug in when you have an exponent with more than one term in it. So I reminded you that everything in the exponent needs to be in parentheses. So notice on this one it was negative 4 plus 2 all in parentheses because it's all part of the exponent. And you see we get the same answer as we did up above. So, Okay, we are ready to graph. So I plugged in or uh, sketched my asymptote. Remember the horizontal asymptote will always be the same unless the graph's been shifted up or down. And a shifting up or down would occur like if you had plus 5 out here. And we don't have any of that. What we do have is a left-right shift. See how that 2 is with the x? So remember when it's with the x, we do the opposite. So this graph will be 2 to the left of the mother function. So where this one crossed at 0, 1, the, this one's going to cross at negative 2, 1 instead, which you can see right here is correct. So if you shift this 2 to the left, that will be the graph of what we're going to draw right now. So it's just a horizontal shift plus 2 with the x means go left 2. So if you took every point you drew on this graph and shifted it left 2, you're going to get the graph we're making now. And uh, no shift up or down because there's no number out back added or subtracted. But I don't know if you remember that from parabolas when it's with the x. It's left and right, like the x-axis, and you do the opposite, so this would be left 2. So we have negative 3, almost a half. So negative 3, just a little bit under a half. Negative 2, 1. So remember how we said every exponential has the point 0, 1, but if you shift it left 2, it's negative 2, 1, which is this point. Uh, negative 1, 2.7, negative 1, 1, 2, 2.5 is in the middle, so 2.7 should just be right above the middle. 0 goes with 7.4, so we're going to have to add 2 again, so here's 8. So 0 to 7.4 would be just shy of the center. And negative 5 is almost, well, let's do negative 4 first. Negative 4 is 0.1, which is just barely above the x-axis, and negative 5 is 0.05, which is even closer to the x-axis. So just make sure your points are going down, but never hit or touch the x-axis. Okay. So now we can see our graph. So we're ready to sketch. So this one's going to come up go through this point here with an arrow and then here we're going to have sliding right along the x-axis but not crossing or touching it just right along the top just make sure it doesn't loop back up because it's just going to keep getting closer and closer and closer and closer to the x-axis we wouldn't even be able to draw it like that because we can't get any closer than we are but Mathematically, it just keeps getting closer and closer and closer to the x-axis, but never touches it. So there is our mother function. Now you can look at both of these together, and it's the same as the function. Here's the mother function. Here's the mother function shifted left to, which we knew happened because of the exponent. So same shape, just every point on this one has been shifted left to to produce this graph. Same horizontal asymptote, y equals 0. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to page 5. This is a fun section. I like to call this section the plug and chug section because the good news is in this class, Math 1, 2x, you do not have to remember these formulas. In the next class, Math 1-5, you do have to remember the formulas. So we get a little grace period, so the formulas will be given to you. So for compound interest, <clears throat> 
the number of compounding periods is finite. That means I can count how many there are. So, um, you know, four per year, two per year, three per year, so on. So P is the principal, and that's the amount invested. So how much did you originally put in your bank account? Or how much, this could even be borrowing money. How much did you borrow at the beginning? So it's the original amount. So that might even be a, a better description because you could be borrowing, you could be investing. So we just call it the original amount. Some will even call it P sub zero, which means original principal. R is the annual interest rate. So that needs to be as a decimal. So you have to remember how to change percents to a decimal for this. Remember you move them two to the left because percent means divided by 100. Per is divided. Cent is the root word for century, which is 100. So percent means divide by 100, which means move the decimal two places to the left. N is the number of times compounded per year. So this is one area that I notice students are kind of uh, shaky on. So let's go over some of the key words for this. So we have annual compounding. Annual means once a year. And semi-annual is another one. That means semi means every half year. So if it's done every half year, that means there's two compounding periods. Uh, next, I think we have quarterly. There's four quarters in a dollar. So quarterly means four compounding periods a year. Every three months is when it is compounded. And you need to know this number. This is called the compounding periods. It's in. Um, let's see, what's next? Maybe monthly? How many months are in a year? 12. So that means this one is compounded 12 times a year. Uh, weekly, there are 52 weeks in a year, so that means they would be compounded 52 times a year. And daily, there's 365 days in a year, most years, so that means it would be compounded 365 times. And I think I got all of them, annual, semi-annual, quarter. And then there is continuously. Compounded continuously has a different formula. And that's because continuously, how can I count how many compounding periods there are? There's an infinite number of compounding periods because it's compounded continuously. So it has its own separate little formula because what would I put in place at n? I can't put infinity there. My calculator doesn't have an infinity. So this is the formula we use for infinite uh, compounding periods. So n is the number of compounding periods per year. So let's just write c above. And t is the time in years. So like I said, they'll give you the formula, you plug the information in, and then you chug away on your calculator. And you don't have to hit enter until the very end. Your calculator knows order of operations, so you can do this whole problem without hitting enter until the end. There are two things that you need to know. Because this exponent has two factors in it, they must be in parentheses because a calculator only knows one thing. If you hit a caret, and put a number in. It only takes the first number you put in as the exponent. So first off, I tell students remember to use this key to tell the calculator that's an exponent. And then when you go to put the exponent in, because it's two things multiplied together, n times t, they need to be in parentheses.
So I always add that to the formula before I ever write it. Then that way when I'm typing it in the calculator, I won't forget. So that is called the compound interest formula. That's when I can count how many compounding periods there are. But if I can't count, if it says continuous compounding, then I use a formula and I <clears throat> In the past have taught 150 and I tell my students the easiest way to remember this is it's called the PERT formula. See the P-E-R-T? So infinite compounding we use the PERT formula because I can't count how many compounding periods there are so I wouldn't know what to put in place of N in this formula so I have to have a new formula. So P is the initial principle just like before. R is the annual interest rate, just like before, and again, it has to be as a decimal. So you have to move the decimal place two places to the left to change it to a decimal. T is still the time in years. So the variables still represent the same thing. We just have to use the PERT formula when it's infinite compounding periods. So let's take a look at what we have here. So find the amount that results from 12,000 being invested. So what would 12,000 be called? What letter? P, right? The principal. And 7%, how would we write that as a decimal? So move the decimal place two places. Right now it's after the 7, so in front of the 7, add a 0. So it's 0.07. That will be my R. Quarterly, four quarters and a dollar. So that means in the number of compounding periods is going to be four. So in is how many times it's compounded per year. And we just said four. And nine years, that's going to be my T. Because you can see T is time in years. So T equals 9. So now we're ready to plug and chug. So let's write the formula because you're going to have to memorize it for your next class. So it's good to write it. You write something seven times, you have it memorized. So principal times 1 plus rate over number of compounding periods to the N times T. So I just copied the formula from above, principal 1 plus R over N, closed it, put my caret in, and then did N times T in parentheses. So then when I fill the numbers in, I'll have it all set up and ready. So we're trying to find the amount, the new amount, after 9 years. So T is 9, so we'd say the amount after 9 years is in place of P, 12,000, 1 plus, the rate is 0 0.07, over N, N is 4, to the N, 4 times T, 9. So now we are ready for the calculator. And like I said, you plug it in all in one step. Don't hit enter. Don't jump and do this first and this second. You just type it from left to right exactly like you see it. No fraction bars, by the way. Use division because fraction bar will not allow you to have decimals in a fraction on the calculator. So you do have to use division, not the fraction bar. Um, I don't know how best I can do this. Okay, I think this is pretty good. Everything seems to be in the screen. So we type in 12,000 parentheses 1 plus 0 0.07 divided by, no fraction bar, 4, the number of compounding periods, caret, and then parentheses 4 times 9, close parentheses. And if you wanted to work that out and write 36, then you wouldn't need parentheses. But if you type it just like this, you do. Hit enter. 
And remember how I told you in class, the only time we're ever allowed to round without being asked is when